All right, so we are recording now. Um, and uh, Carla, Kevin, is there anything that you want to say before I jump in? I will just say hello, everyone. We are so happy that you are able to join us today. I sat through the webinar this morning. It is full of resources and tools and a lot of fun. So uh, welcome and thank you for joining us and thank you, Jeff, for delivering. Kevin? much the same here. Thanks everyone for uh, spending some time with us this afternoon. It is jam-packed. Uh, our suggestion, I think it was echoed if uh, anyone is rejoining us uh, this afternoon that was with us this morning. You're more than welcome to uh, try to do all the clicks and everything uh, as Jeff does them, but you know we would suggest you just sit back, uh, get a pen or paper handy and a pencil and just make some notes because we will make this recording available to you that you can watch uh, afterward and go back and explore some things in greater detail. If you will, send your questions to us as things come up where you need clarification using the uh, Q&A tool that Jeff will describe to you. And uh, just uh, general comments that appear, uh, we'll get to those as time permits. Thanks again, everyone, for everything that you do. All right, great, thank you both. Uh, so yeah, um, just be before I even dive into how to use Zoom and, and, and the content of this webinar, uh, thank you for taking the time today and thank you for, again, your commitment to keeping learning going for your learners in whatever way you can. And so as Kevin said, I am going to be bouncing through a lot of different tools. Mostly that is to, to really show you the experience of using these tools or these things in real time. Um, and it's, an, it's been an interesting two weeks for me because I have used these tools sort of singularly in different presentations that I do at workshops and presentations um, w within states, but you know, pulling them together all in once uh, is a lot, but the goal is to expose you to these tools. And what I want you to do as you're watching is to think about um, which tools seem to be ones that uh, could be useful for me um, and uh, realistic for me to be using with my students uh, both in terms of the content, but in terms of sort of the digital skills that you and your students uh, need to have in order to use them, as well as considerations such as access. So um, the things that we present here, this is not a, hey, you need to do all of these things. It is to provide you with a, a sort of a limited menu of options of things that we know are used and are effective by adult educators with their students. And the goal of that is for you to then think about which ones are going to work best for me in my context. Um, and that's understanding that you have probably shifted priorities in the midst of what we're going through. And most certainly many of your students have shifted priorities as well. Um, the second thing that I've prefaced all of these with is just because we're talking about these things in the context of how can I start learning right now with my students in this sort of hopefully temporary situation that we find ourselves in. <clears throat> As you learn about these different tools, I want you to have a mind's eye, not just towards, hey, great, I could use this right now with my students, but think about when you were back to normal, when you're back in that classroom again, face to face with your students, what are things and practices that I might want to continue doing with my students so that yes, we have that face to face time, that I can really focus on direct instruction and supporting my learners. But a lot of these online tools and resources are things that can extend learning beyond the classroom walls. Because um, that's the beauty of technology is that it affords us the ability to give learners options both inside and outside of the classroom. So keep that in mind. So as Kevin just mentioned, if you have questions, we do want you to post them. And at the bottom of your Zoom window, and I want you to think about this also from the context of if you've probably heard a lot about Zoom over the past few weeks, so I want you to think about is Zoom a tool that I might want to use with my students. So at the bottom of your Zoom window, you're going to see there's audio settings here that allow you to switch from either computer audio or to phone audio, depending on what you want to do. And I'll say up front, Zoom is something that, uh, you know, right now you may be on a computer, excuse me, um, and it's video based and it can be very intensive in terms of data, um, in terms of using a data plan that someone, if they're only accessing from the phone. 
<clears throat> you could run a Zoom and, and not make it so visually intensive in terms of everyone needs to see what's on screen in order to know what's going on. And you could simply use it just as a tool to have check-in meetings with your students um, where they're just dialing in, they're not accessing it at all on a computer screen. Um, and therefore it's just a phone call, right? Uh, but that everyone can be in on that phone call together as, as a class meeting. So uh, consider that. Um, these ones in the middle are the ones that are gonna be most important for us today. So if you have a question, please, 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 particularly if it's one that we might not be able to get to, use the Q&A because when, when you use the Q&A, we actually get a log at the end that includes all of the questions that people have asked. And that's really helpful because what that allows us to do um, is go back to that log afterwards. And if there's anything that I wasn't able to attend to during the call or during the webinar, excuse me, uh, we can go back and answer those questions. And we can also see, wow, these were questions that were asked a lot. So we probably wanna put that out in the follow-up email to folks to make sure that everyone's hearing it because it probably wasn't a unique question to just one person. The raise your hand tool is one that I will use um, during this because I think it's helpful when you're thinking about this in a class setting. Um, I might ask you a question, hey, please raise your hand if you were able to access the Wakelet. Um, so this is a tool that I on my end will see, okay, next to everyone's name, I see a little handprint and that's going to tell me, okay, everyone has been able to get into the Wakelet um, and been able to access it. And if not, uh, I could chat people individually that maybe haven't and resend the link directly to that person. So that's kind of nice, a nice tool, but I will use that limitedly today. The chat window is something that I will be using heavily today because in addition to what we show on screen uh, and what's in the Wakelet, <clears throat> I'll be communicating and pasting links to things that I want you to go to during the course of today's webinar. Now what you see is when you click on chat, you'll see this panel appear on the right hand side of your screen. And just zooming in on what that looks like, at the top here is the ongoing chat log that's been happening as people have been talking. And down here is where you can click to type. Now, <clears throat> one thing to notice is what my uh, window says here in this little picture that I took is all panelists and attendees. On this webinar, the default is just to the panelists. And so if you are, if it says uh, panelists, then the only people that are going to see that communication are Kevin, Carla, and myself. So you wanna click on this little down arrow and it will open up a menu that gives you the option of chatting to everyone. Um, so please go ahead and just uh, do that now because I will be asking just for people to, you know, either comment on something from time to time. And again, as I'm talking about different things, this is where we'll be posting um, specific links to certain things that we're talking about. So uh, someone has put something in the chat and they've just said hello, and they've said hello to all panelists uh, and attendees. So hello, Belinda. Thanks for uh, using the chat. All right. Uh, and just uh, as a case in point, this is what it will look like on my end when I ask a question, if I say, hey, raise your hand, I see all of the attendees, there's 76, and it, for whatever question this was, there were 50 that had raised their hands. So it gave me the opportunity to know, okay, not everyone's been able to get in, let me resubmit the link or, or share um, or provide additional guidance. So that's kind of what that looks like. So you may have joined us last week, <clears throat> and up front, there'll be a little bit of repeat just because we want to sort of, again, sort of remind everybody about sort of your goals for distance learning and for online instruction with students right now and some of the things that you need to think about up front. But both today and then on Thursday, we're doing more subject specific presentations. Today's, we did one at 10 o'clock this morning. We're doing this one at two now. We're doing 10 and two on uh, Thursday as well. Today's were, uh, is going to be on reading and Thursday's are going to be on math instruction. And the goal is to dive a little bit deeper into the specific content resources that you could use in those areas. And so once again, as I did on Thursday, I forgot to update the times um, on this session outline because I'm using the same presentation. But right now we're in the midst of setup and introduction. We're then going to do a quick overview of evidence-based reading instruction. 
which from the sounds of it this morning, many of you are probably already familiar with evidence-based reading instruction, so we won't spend too much time on that. Uh, then we're gonna dive into the resources that can support evidence-based reading instruction, and then talk about ways that you can be designing uh, online reading experiences for your learners and thinking about, do I want to create assignments? Do I want to post just websites that people can go to and access readings? Do I want to maybe have a book club format where I push out to everybody, hey, uh, this is an article or a set of articles I want you to read. And on Wednesday, we're going to have a Zoom meeting and we are going to talk about that reading together. So thinking about sort of different ways that you might create these experiences uh, that provide some sort of regularity uh, for your learners and make it easy for them to access and easy for you to manage. And then we'll save some time for questions and follow-ups. At the end, I will say this morning's we did go over, <coughs> excuse me, the 90 minute mark. Um, I'm going to try my best to keep it to 90 minutes, but we did have some fun at the end because uh, I showed some, some fun tools that can be used to provide sort of real-time interactivity with you and your learners um, in a very easy and entertaining way. So um, hopefully we won't have to extend too far beyond. Uh, the primary tools we'll be using today, because I think this is important, uh, and we're thinking about structuring how you're doing distance learning. Obviously we are in Zoom right now. So Zoom is a tool that allows you for you to hold meetings and to hold webinars like I'm doing here. Zoom is 100% free to you right now if you have an instructor email account, um, and it allows you to do video-based meetings such as this, or even just uh, phone calls because there's a dial-in number as well. So if you wanna have synchronous or in-person from a distance uh, meetings at any sort of frequency, Zoom would be a tool that you could use to do that. Um, some teachers are literally doing their normal class times and maybe, like maybe doing just like a half an hour of sort of face-to-face. -face. Some people are holding sort of regular open office hours where they say, on these days and these times, I am available to talk with you about anything and people can hop in during those times. Um, but it is nice because it does allow for connection, which obviously there's less and less of that for us right now in this um, moment of quarantine. Uh, we are also going to be using a Padlet <clears throat> not extensively, but it's going to be an open place for you to be able to collaborate together and to share some of your ideas might be a tool of interest for you. Um, it is something that I know is widely used by adult educators. So I just want to give you that experience so you can see it. Uh, if you did any of the sessions last week, we did use Google Classroom. I have that same classroom open for this. Um, I encourage you to join it because I have been pushing out assignments uh, related to the types of things that we've been talking about to everyone in the classroom. I have 400 students now, so it's kind of a big class, but it's nice because it will give you the experience of seeing from a student perspective uh, what it looks like to get assignments in Zoom, uh, excuse me, in um, Google Classroom, which is a learning management system. And so it allow you to make some decisions in terms of, is this something that I could realistically try right now with my students? Uh, is it something that maybe down the road I might be interested in using with my students? And then finally, Wakelet, which was the link that we had up front, that is a content and assignment tool of sorts. Uh, <coughs> it was originally developed not as an education tool at all. It was literally a curation tool uh, with the notion that, hey, um, I can create a wakelet that has um, websites uh, to all of the places that I want to visit on my upcoming trip. Um, or I have one that is literally where I have a wakelet of winter recipes and I have one of vegetarian recipes. Um, so I can just like literally paste the link into it and then I have this nice curated list of content. But educators got their hands on this tool, which is completely free, as are all these tools. And then they started using it to curate resources for their learners. So here are the websites that you can use at any time that are going to help you with reading or math or science, or they're even using it to create lessons. So they'll have a wakelet that is a lesson on, say, main idea and details, 
and they'll provide a uh, video from Flocabulary or something that talks about main idea and details. Then they'll provide a reading, and then they'll provide a graphic organizer that they ask students to fill out that, uh, where they outline the main idea and the detail from the reading. So it's a very cool and flexible tool that you can use, and it allows you to put everything in one place. And I think that's the most important about that tool, because again, as you're going to see right now, I'm going to be flying through a lot of resources. And what's nice is you will get a Wakelet that has everything that we talk about today in one single place. Now, here's the URL to that Wakelet again. I think the last thing I pasted it into the chat window again. Um, and so, as I said, Wakelet is a curation tool that allows you to pull things together in one place. And it may be that you want to pull together URLs um, or sets of resources or build lessons. So I'm going to show you what that Wakelet looks like right now. Again, in the chat window, I pasted the link that you can go to to get to the Wakelet. But just so you see what this is, <coughs> this is a collection on Wakelet that I created. And um, within it, I have a link uh, and a set of instructions for how to get into the Google Classroom that we're using um, and that I will continue to monitor for a little bit even after these sessions. Again, for the experiential, I'm getting experience using Google Classroom as well from the teacher side, so I benefit from this. Um, and then you also will get to see from the student side. But here are instructions for how to get into Google Classroom. Uh, including the code, and then here's a link to an article. So think about any digital literacy thing that you need your students to sort of wrap their heads around. You could use a Wakelet to say, this is how you log into Zoom. This is how you log into Google Classroom. This is how you get to, or here are the reading resources that I want you to use. Everything can be in one place, and then that's like a go-to stop for students to get the information that they need on the how-tos and the resources that you want to be them to be using. So <coughs> that's what's up top. And then the session resources. So you'll see, here's a link that I created to the slides that we'll be walking through. Here's a link to the Padlet that I'll be showing you in a second. And I want folks to use to collaborate as we're talking through. And then as we talk about the different components of evidence-based reading instruction, here's the resource we're gonna dive into. Here are some additional things that uh, you might use and consider in terms of helping students practice fluency. Here's a sample activity that I created that you might be able to do with your students that develops fluency and also digital literacy skills. Uh, vocabulary, here's the resource that we're using and another one that I'll share with you. Here are all the comprehension websites that we're gonna talk about, as well as an activity you might wanna do, as well as a quiz that shows another resource called Quizzes. Um, that you might be interested in using with students. Uh, then here's a set of reading wakelets that I've created, uh, as well as additional resources that might be of interest to you after the presentation and after today's webinar. <coughs> so this is a, uh, oh, so someone's asked for the full uh, URL for this. So I will share the full URL in case that bit.ly is not working. So I've pasted a, uh, the longer version of the URL for this Wakelet. I had created a condensed version. Um, Kevin, I think, posted one as well. So Kevin will manage. Actually, so I'm going to use the raise hand. Uh, so on your, on your Zoom panel at the bottom, you have the raise hand button. I would like you to raise your hand if you have been able to successfully open the Wakelet. So on your panel at the bottom, there's a raise hand tool. I want you to click on that if you have been able to successfully uh, open the Wakelet. And again, the Wakelet is in the chat. And so now what I'm seeing on my screen uh, is the number of people that have been able to open the Wakelet because folks are raising their hands. So um, <clears throat> last time I will say, please raise your hand, use that raise your hand icon if you have been able to open the Wakelet. Now, for the sake of time, um, I am going to, so someone like, so someone just chatted to me, no, I was not. So I can directly 
uh, send the link to that specific person, which I just did uh, to the person who just said that. And now they have that link and hopefully now they can open it up. Um, so I'll stop there, but you noticed I kind of, I gave time for everyone to do that. And that's a reality that when we're working in an online environment, you're definitely going to need to think about the fact that things are going to take longer than normal um, because this is new for everyone. And, and one of the things that you need to make sure students are aware of is that we are all learners right now in learning how to use these tools. Um, and that's a great way to diffuse any apprehension that students might have. Um, let them know that we, we're gonna take our time on learning to use these things. I also wanna use that as an opportunity to say, while I'm talking about all of these different resources, you're gonna to wanna to very much focus on the, one, the ones that you feel are the most useful to you right now and not try to overload yourself or your learners. Um, that's really critical. Uh, another thing that was brought up this morning that I wanna bring up in this because we're recording this is someone was accessing this from the iPad or their iPad and they said, it's really hard for me to have all these different tabs open. Now I'm working in a browser as you can see, so I have the ability to easily hop to each of the things that I'm talking about. Someone in an iPad, that's a little harder, and then someone on a phone, that is definitely harder. So when you're thinking about anything, particularly that you wanna do live with students, you're going to wanna keep it simple, right? Because that's gonna be a real challenge if you're trying to use, as I am trying to do right now, so do as I say, not as I do, but if you're using a Wakelet at the same time as you're using a Padlet, as the same time you're using a slides presentation, right? So think about that up front as well um, as you're considering what you wanna use. <clears throat> Google Classroom is the other thing I just wanna show you. Um, this is a tool that allows for managing, again, it's a content and learning management system. So in your Wakelet, uh, if you click on Google Classroom, it's going to load up Google Classroom for you. Now, um, if you joined the class last week, uh, if you went to one of the Thursday sessions, then this is the same exact class. You don't need to do anything. Um, if you have not already joined that, what you see here is go to Google Classroom, uh, click the Go to Classroom button, which I will do right here. And then I'll just close this window to keep things simple. Then it says click the plus sign near the top of the page and select join class. So on here at the top, there's this plus sign and it says join class. And then it's going to ask you to enter in a student code. And the student code is this, so I can copy that. And then I'm going to paste that in here. And then I am going to be joined into this class. Uh, so now I'm actually looking at this from the student perspective from my personal account. I am running the class on my other account, which is my uh, crowded learning account. And so we can see that some people have said good afternoon. People are already in here. Um, so this is a tool that allows you to manage classwork. You see I've been creating assignments for folks. Um, so that again, they can see the experience of receiving an assignment and completing an assignment from a student perspective. So if this is of interest to you, go ahead and join. Um, we'll send this out afterwards, but you know, it's not required. Um, but it is one of the tools that you could possibly be using. And again, I'm kind of maintaining it because it's helpful for me to just sort of see how it works from a teacher perspective. But what is nice about it is because you have this feed, it becomes a communication tool. Because you can link in students' emails, it becomes a communication tool as well. So it does provide sort of regularity of communication all in one place, along with the assignments that you want students to do. So it could be a helpful tool because it's kind of killing a bunch of different birds with, with one stone. All right, so those are the tools that we're talking about. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the last one we're going to have you open up again, as, uh, as was said, you don't have to do any of these things and maybe you just want to watch. Um, but the last one is the Padlet. Um, and again, in your Wakelet, there is a link to this Padlet here. So I am going to click on that. <clears throat> and what you'll see in here is I left all of the stuff that was in this morning session. This is a place for people to share ideas 
around the four components of evidence-based reading instruction. So all you have to do is click on uh, any of these, <coughs> and then you, will, you can say, um, I use IXL with my students. They can select uh, whichever activities they want. So I'm just giving information for others to see, oh, this is a great resource that I use. So if you are using things right now, either online or even like uh, print that you want to share, like, hey, this is a great resource that my students love or that I love using, go ahead and do that. All you do is click on the plus sign at the bottom here, um, and then that's it. It posts. And then other people can comment uh in there as well and maybe they say i use that or hey i would love information on that can you share uh, the link um so this is sort of a collaborative tool that teachers can use for all sorts of different ways it is free um, and one of the questions that came up regarding wakelet and padlet is yes they are both free if you want to create things on them you need an account um, your students do not need accounts to get to them but having an account helps because then you can save them, um, save the padlets and the wakelets uh, that you use. Um, Padlet has limitations. You can only create, I believe it's three, although some people keep saying seven. Um, you can have seven, three or seven, I'm not sure, different padlets. I've been fine just having three. I just kind of reuse the same ones and then re reset them. Um, and then you'd need to pay. Uh, Wakelet is entirely free. There is no paying for Wakelets. You can have as many Wakelets as you want, uh, and you'll see in a second that I do have a ton of Wakelets on there. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for continuing to uh, monitor the questions. So, <coughs> um, in terms of the upfront stuff, that will be slight repeat. As you're thinking about these tools, uh, this is data from the survey that we did a couple weeks ago of teachers in Georgia regarding what modes of communication are you using with students. So email was the most common, um, phone calls was the second most common. Uh, a lot of folks are familiar with messaging, but you know, as not shocking, um, a lot of folks have not been using video conferencing. Um, so when you're considering what tools you wanna to start using, if you weren't already using a tool like Remind to text or WhatsApp to text, is think about what are your goals and what tools are your students are you already using? If they're familiar with texting, then maybe that is the mode. If you know they're not gonna be checking your email, um, then maybe you wanna use a tool like Remind that allows you to push out things in a text-based format um, where they get notifications on their phone because that's what you know they're used to using and what works. Um, and then the last question is really, how much of your instruction do you feel must be synchronous? And I think that's really important when we're talking about reading instruction. If you wanna be doing direct instruction on reading, that's great, but does that need to be a majority of your, your time and your students' time? So a lot of the resources that we're gonna to share today are leveled libraries, right? So those are things that it's more of a, hey, I want you to read this story, or hey, here's a selection of readings that you can pick from, read two to three and come back to me with um, summaries of each story that you read or something along those lines. That does not require for you to be on a Zoom meeting, right? Um, if you want to be providing direct instruction, say um, sharing a passage with students and having it on screen, and then showing how you might fill out a graphic organizer uh, to show the comparisons and contrasts that are in that article, then yes, maybe you want to do a Zoom meeting, or maybe you wanna do a Zoom and record it, which is something that you could do. Um, so in that instance, like what I'm doing right now, I am recording this. I could do a Zoom for nobody and record what I'm doing and then save that video and share that with students. Um, so that's perfectly acceptable. And then again, that doesn't require everyone to be in the same place but I can provide a video that people can watch at any time in any place. And it also does use less bandwidth for them to watch that video than it does for them to join a Zoom meeting live. <coughs> um, and again, you might just use messaging tools and a lot of teachers do use these messaging tools. You might use it to 
remind students of an assignment or just say, I need you to do this this week. I will check in periodically. You might use it to set up a, hey, um, we are going to meet on Wednesday this week. Please be sure to join. And again, something like Zoom that can be challenging for folks. Uh, you might, you know, sort of, I could, if I had all of you in a remind room, I could have five minutes before we were going to start this, send out a remind with the link so that you're not fumbling, wait, where did I, where did they put that Zoom link? Where do I go to join this meeting? It's going to immediately be in front of them um, on their remind app. So um, think about the ways that that would be most helpful to you um, if you want to use messaging tools. And then also you do need to be upfront and considering bandwidth and frequency. So what access do your students have? You do not want to require your students to join a Zoom with video a lot if you know that they have uh, low, uh, low data plans, right? That they have limited data plans because those, these do require a high amount of bandwidth. <clears throat> so this graphic, which I shared earlier, uh, or Thursday, excuse me, just sort of has you think about the different types of communication tools and methods of instruction you might want to use based on how frequently you want to be teaching, as well as the level of bandwidth that uh, you will require for these things, and therefore considerations to be made in terms of what's reasonable um, and realistic given what your student situation is. And for all of these, as we did with you, and if you did the survey, ask the questions so that we could see sort of what's going on and how people are working. Um, the same thing might be the case for you. You might want to poll your students uh, to find out information about, are they able to access anything from a computer? Because if they're not, then you know, there's, that's definite limitations on which one of these things is going to be most important. Um, after this call, one of the things that I will be sharing in the Google Classroom is an implementation plan template for you. Um, but as we walk through, and for the sake of not having a gazillion windows open, I want you to think about, as we're talking through these resources, what is your communication plan? What are the resources that we learn about today or that you learned about last week that you uh, might be interested in using? And then what tools are you gonna use and methods are you gonna use for sharing content, for managing content, or for reminding students and checking back in with students? Um, so this will be an implementation plan template that we provide to you afterwards. But as we're walking forward now, I want you to think about uh, these things as we're talking about um, everything. So now I want you to use the chat. Uh, and <coughs> two upfront uh, terms that I'm talking about is open education resources. So Crowded Learning, my organization, is an organization that focuses entirely on free and open education resources. And I say that because there is a difference between free resources and open. Um, all of the things that you're gonna be looking at are freely available. Um, some of them are openly licensed, some of them are not. And you know they are if they have something called the Creative Commons license. And I'll just jump back to this graphic. If you notice at the bottom left, this is a Creative Commons license. And what's nice about that is that tells me I, what I can and cannot do with this graphic. I have to attribute the source, I cannot use it commercially, and I have to, if I do uh, sort of provide a Creative Commons license, I have to, when I do share this out, it has to have the same exact license. So you have to know these things. I have an entire session that talks about the difference, but the important thing with that is this. Um, if something's Creative Commons license, you have more sort of flexibility with what you can do with it, how you can share it. For example, one of the resources that we look at today, you're gonna to see I copy pasted sentences from the passage and put it into a worksheet. The reason I know that I am allowed to do that is because they licensed it with Creative Commons license. So I am allowed to do that. I'm not violating their copyright by doing that. Um, certain sites aren't and every website has a terms of use. So if you're thinking that, oh, I wanna, download the PDF of a reading from Common Lit, and then email that PDF to students. Uh, Common Lit is not an open education resource, but you can check within their terms of use to see what they allow. The nice thing, that, so they may very well allow it, but you actually have to dig to find it. And that's the nice thing about a Creative Commons license, is it very upfront says, these are the things you can do, 
Um, and this is all we ask of you when you do that. And so I just want you to be aware of that as we're talking about using all of these free resources. The other term is evidence-based reading instruction. So one of the things I want you to do right now is in the chat, I would like you to indicate if you have ever heard of or use evidence-based reading instruction. So just say yes. Uh, have you heard of or no? Um, and do you use evidence-based reading instruction? Because this is helpful um, for us to see in terms of people's background on it, uh, because we want to make sure that we are, um, you know, tailoring this to to everyone's needs. So, <clears throat> as I said, crowded learning focuses on free resources, and on our website and in the Wakelet. Uh, we have free resource directories in uh, different subject areas, 12 different subject areas, academic skills, employability skills, and 21st century skills. So while we're going to be focusing on resources that are just in the reading section, I want you to think about, well, you know, I teach social studies or I teach science. Are there resources there that I could use and be talking about and, and focusing on the reading and reading skill development, which you definitely can be doing. Um, the communication directory does have a lot of things in particular for ESL students. Um, financial literacy, that is a huge focus. And so again, actually in thinking about our new realities, both in terms of the setting that we're in and how we're teaching, we need to be mindful of our learners' realities as well. There's two things that they're heavily focused on right now, health and money, right? Um, with what's going on. So we have a health literacy directory and we have a financial literacy directory that has free resources. And maybe those are the things that you wanna be focusing on and creating activities for your learners. And that's perfectly fine. We also have, and, and appropriate for a time right now. Um, we also have uh, information literacy resource directory, which is really critical as we deal with sort of having to know what's true information and what's misinformation. Um, both now in this crisis and then obviously we're in an election year, which I guess thankfully, if there's anything, we've, we've kind of forgotten in this election year because that's always never fun. Um, however, information literacy is a critical tool, especially as we're asking learners to learn online. Um, and so I want you to you know, think about using some of those other resources beyond even those that we share here um, if, if you want to focus on topical things. Um, the, the resources that we're going to be looking at are, are all related to areas of evidence-based reading instruction. So comprehension tools, fluency tools, uh, we'll just focus on this, but this is um, available to you on our teacher tools site. And then we're going to be focusing on vocabulary uh, only. We're not going to focus on grammar, but we're looking at just the range of language arts resources. Um, these are sort of the, the best of the best in all of these different areas. Um, I'm going to point out a, uh, a, a professional development resource that's in the wakelet at the bottom that has a sort of slower paced walkthrough of all of these tools. Um, and it's a print based thing that you can use and access at any time because it's openly licensed. But we're going to dive into evidence based reading instruction right now. <coughs> so, evidence based reading instruction looks at reading sort of holistically. And it is a research-based model that's focused specifically on direct and explicit instruction. So instead of just saying, hey, this is what main idea and details are, here's a graphic organizer, let's fill it out, it's teacher modeling and explanation of the concept. So as you are reading something, showing how a good and effective reader stops and asks questions of texts. So wait, the author says they are from uh, this organization. What does that tell me about what their opinion might be or how objective they might be on this topic that I'm reading about? Those aren't things that someone just implicitly knows how to do. That requires modeling and direct instruction. So for all of these components that we're gonna look at, um, there is a heavy direct instruction sort of component to it. Um, it's a research-based model, and it's actually the model that is um, sort of promoted by OCTE and the Department of Education for Adult Education. Uh, and it's, it's basically uh, through STAR reading training that I know a number of states have done is, is sort of the model that's used in that training. And one of your WIOA requirements as an adult ed provider, um, if you are WIOA funded, is one of the components that you're graded on is are you using research-based models for instruction, particularly in literacy? 
And so that's why it's really important to understand these. So the notion of it is, and you're probably familiar with all of these terms, maybe not alphabetics, but alphabetics is basically phonics. And the way all of these things sort of fit together is on the top half, we're looking at things related to recognizing words on a page. So alphabetics is phonics. So word by word, can a student read those words? Do they understand vowel consonant patterns? Do they know long vowels versus short vowels? Do they know the sounds that every letter makes? So these are beginning readers. Um, there aren't really alphabetics uh, standards much beyond tape level E. Um, or CCRS level B. Um, everything else is more focused on, on more um, advanced concepts. Fluency is also related to recognizing words. So instead of just reading individual words, fluency now asks a student to be able to read a sentence or a paragraph or a full text. And what it refers to is being able to recognize that this set of words is a phrase or a chunk of text that is intended to be read sort of continuously with no breaks. Uh, this punctuation indicates that there is a break in the text. And fluency is not just about speed or knowing those breaks because if someone is, is intonating correctly as they're talking, it is a, or reading, it is a demonstration of their understanding of the words that they are reading. Um, so this is both a recognition of text, but when we talk about fluency, it's not just how fast can you read. On the bottom portion, we have vocabulary and comprehension. So these are both focused on understanding what you're reading. But again, since vocabulary is on the left side here, it's looking at do you understand the words? This particular word, do you know its meaning? And then the right-hand side, we're looking at full text, that's comprehension, which is obviously the focus of our reading instruction is making sure that students understand and can comprehend the text. So these are the four components. Um, so I wanna pause there and again, remind you that as we talk about these four components and we talk about the resources within, I would love for you, so someone did say that they like this resource IXL that we're gonna share, so thank you. But feel free to comment and say, what are the things that you use um, for these things, as well as what are things uh, that you might be interested in using, and, and also what are your strategies for using them? Because that helps everybody here in this presentation. So uh, now we're gonna focus on alphabetics. So as I said earlier, alphabetics is, is phonics, and so this is for earlier readers, and it's understanding what sounds letters make, what sounds letter combinations make, um, and sort of word analysis. And so the focus is on that word analysis and being able to recognize words. Um, I already talked through all of these. Um, fluency is decoding the words in, and being able to do it accurately and efficiently um, and not stumbling on words as you read. So that's one of the things that one does is monitor uh, reading and monitor uh, what words. Sometimes you'll have a reading and you ask them to read it and you will check off the words that they have a difficulty with and that's a method for understanding what types of phonics they need to sort of go back to and work on. Um, but it also looks at prosody and intonation and making sure that folks are enunciating correctly with their language as well as chunking text because the way they chunk text is an indication of their comprehension. Vocabulary, as I said earlier, is understanding the individual words, but in evidence-based reading instruction and in the standards, the focus uh, is on tier two words and providing multiple exposures to those words. And tier two words are what is referred to as academic vocabulary. So not sort of, not I'm gonna say obvious, but sort of naming vocabulary like dog or computer or lamp, but things like summarize or understand. Um, these are words that the meaning might not be immediately obvious to a learner, um, but they are heavily used in informational and academic texts. And since the standards focus more on informational texts than literary texts, we need to make sure that students are exposed to these words. And then finally, comprehension. I think you all know what that means. So this is understanding the text, understanding how it is structured, uh, being able to identify the main idea, being able to infer details, um, being able to summarize what a text is all about um, and being able to analyze text in terms of understanding what it was intended to do, what is the author's point of view, um, what am I supposed to know how to do after reading this. So now we're going to dive into all of the resources um, that uh, 
that are free that are all listed on our website and that are all included in the Wakelet for you to consider um, and to be able to access after this and explore on your own. So again, um, as we're talking, I'd love for you to add to the Padlet if there are specific resources that you think you're gonna be interested in using, but we're gonna focus first on alphabetics. Now, I said this this morning, I'll say this this afternoon, of the four components, uh, there is, there's, there's the least resources available that focus on alphabetics because alphabetics is obviously early reading, it's phonics. So a lot of the things that are available to students uh, are, are geared towards children and not towards adults. So that is one thing to consider. Um, these are two resources in particular that I've heard uh, frequently are used in an adult ed. I will add a third that I know you need to talk to your program administrator to, to find out how to get access to, but it's a tool called Learning Upgrade and it is an app. And to the point I just made about things being childish, uh, Learning Upgrade was uh, entered into an adult ed uh, a learning app competition that ran for like five years, it just finished last year. <clears throat> and it went, when it made the finalist list, um, I, I and a number of colleagues were very surprised because we knew it had been designed for K-12 and they didn't really make any, any attempt to make it more adult in terms of the look and feel, its songs, its games. Um, and so there was sort of this eyebrow raised as to, is this appropriate? It ended up winning the competition. And the reason it won the competition is because those were enjoyable experiences. And in a time like now, uh, maybe that is the type of learning environment that's going to be sort of the most uh, approachable to somebody where everything seems so stressful right now. But we heard stories of people downloading the app and it's, it's available for free right now as part of that competition. And maybe your state has purchase license, I'm not sure, but it sounds like it is available um, through your administrator, so talk to them. Um, but we heard stories of people coming home from work at 10 p.m and then binge learning for three hours because they found the app so enjoyable. It does track time, um, so that's important, and it does focus on earlier levels of reading and language. So um, it, that might be something that you want to look at. In terms of the free resources that I will share, IXL is a website that you do need to create an account, but uh, it, um, I won't right now, I don't have an account. It allows you to go through a few things each day for free. Uh, this is how it's laid out. So it's, it's, it's very comprehensive in terms of these are the language. It also has math and other subjects as well. But in terms of um, the resources focused on alphabetics and phonics, I can click on the one of them and we'll look at this. And it's basically going to walk through a set of questions um, on this topic. So which word does not rhyme? So we have tree. Which word does not rhyme? And there's audio tree. that goes with it. B. Save. And so they click in advance and then they move on through these questions. So there's um, 10 questions and this, I think each set has 10 questions. They see how many questions they answer and if they create an account, they can um, save um, their work. So there are a lot of lessons on here um, focused on the various uh, areas and the various skills. So um, this is a tool that I've heard from a number of adult educators they like using. Learning Chocolate is the other one that I will show. Um, it is particularly relevant for ESL students, and I've seen this heavily used um, within schools here in Chicago. Now, the page that I've linked to here is just to the alphabet and phonics, uh, which is the topic that we're talking about here, fluency. But you'll see there are the same sort of large sets of different word uh, banks for all of these different areas. So work and food and house and animals and parts of the body and all sorts of things. Um, one of the things you'll also note is, well, just look at the internet working because the internet is one big marketing machine. Suddenly it's advertising to me for IXL because I was just there. So there's lots of ads um, on learning chocolate, which is definitely annoying. But when I go into learning chocolate, so I'm going to go to G. Uh, we'll look at consonant sounds here. <clears throat> and I go to launch one of these. I have the ability, and I see this, students get conditioned to do this. Just click on this little icon, and it's going to maximize your screen with just the activity. So one of the reasons I really like learning chocolate is it has this same sequence 
of activities for every single one of those sets of, of words, or in this case, uh, vowel sounds, consonants, and, and, and grammar, or excuse me, phonics things, um, for every one of those sets. And so it starts with just seeing the words and being able to click to hear the words. And then the first activity has them match the, the words uh, to the sound. Goose, gate. There you go. Gate. And when they're done, they can check their answers. I can actually check my answers now and it will show them what they got wrong uh, or, 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 or right. The second activity in here does not have audio. So now they need to recognize the image and recognize the word. So this is focused on the reading skill as opposed to the, the listening skill. And so I match the words um, to these things. And then again, I can check the answers and it's going to tell me. The third activity has no words. So it's just matching audio Girl. to the image. Girl. Go. Seems Go. to be using the same thing. So this is just the listening and being able to recognize the image um, and what, what word it is through listening skills. So then we get into uh, writing skills. So now in this case, uh, it's not giving me a word bank, so know that. This is, we, you'd want students to be familiar with the words before they attempted this, um, but they're typing out the word. And then the last activity is dictation. Girl. Keep coming to girl. So where they um, have to spell the word. Um, and they're prompted through this di dictation here. So every single set in Learning Chocolate follows that same sequence, which I think is very helpful because students can get used to that pattern. Um, and then they can self-explore on this to anything that they uh, want to learn about, right? Um, I just clicked on people. Um, so bad character traits, character traits, family tree, all sorts of things. Um, so it's an excellent vocabulary tool as well. Um, and again, it's very appropriate for ESL learners. So now we're going to focus on fluency tools. And again, fluency uh, focuses on a reader's ability to read text uh, sort of together um, and to be able to read with proper intonation, proper chunking, proper phrasing, and prosody. Before I dive into fluency, uh, Kevin, have you seen, I don't see the chat being very active right now, which I guess is good. Um, have you seen any questions? Doesn't look like it. No, right now we're pretty good, Jeff. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. Again, if you do have a question, um, put it in the Q and A and we will, uh, be sure to try to answer it during this call. Uh, so one of the things when we're talking about fluency, that's really important is understanding that a passage uh, is not going to help a learner with developing fluency if it is not at the right level of complexity for that learner. So the College of Career Readiness Standards provides guidance for that, and these are the bands within the standards. And you'll see B, C, D, E, those are the levels in the CCRS. The corresponding TABE levels, if that's what you uh, sort of know in terms of leveling, uh, this is level E, this is level M, this is level D, this is level A of TAB. And uh, these are all different readability scales that are used. The one that's pretty heavily used in education is the Lexile framework. So on the websites that we're going to be looking at today, uh, the readability sort of features that you'll see in terms of being able to filter texts and find texts at levels the level they'll be using is the Lexile levels. And so it's important to know what levels of readings are appropriate for students, uh, particularly when we're talking about fluency. So reading skills for today's adults is the um, resource that uh, I'm gonna focus on when we're talking about fluency. Uh, and it's actually from an organization, an adult ed organization in Southwest Minnesota um, called Southwest Adult Basic Education. And they created this site years ago called Reading Skills for Today's Adults that has readings at early reading levels and those early Lexile levels. <clears throat> and there's about 350 readings in that site. Another resource that they created uh, was Reading Skills for Healthcare Workers, which has a very similar format to Reading Skills for Today's Adults, um, but it's also leveled and it's more middle levels, but all of the passages 
are designed for people interested in healthcare careers. Um, but a lot of them, it doesn't even, it's not even really career based. It's just focusing on health scenarios or health based scenarios. So again, whereas health is a sort of critical thing in many people's minds right now, um, that might be an interesting tool to explore. But in terms of the format of these, and actually before I jump in, uh, this is a resource that a lot of people in my sort of travels have told me they're aware of and use because it has been out for a while. However, they just did an update and you're definitely going to want to make sure that you're going to the correct site. So if you were to Google reading skills for today's adults, it's going to bring you to this URL um, for some reason. I don't know why they don't just take it down, but it is not down as far as I know. You do not want to go to that because that is the old site and they, uh, they did not have the Lexile levels. Um, the new site is broken down into 16 uh, sort of bands of readability and it's reading skills for today. And that's the link that is in your wakelet. Um, so just know that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna hop into that site and I will do it actually through the wakelet so that you can see this is how wakelet works. I just clicked on that link and now I'm in reading skills for today's adults. So once you are in there, um, you have all these different levels. Now, rather than say, hey, go to reading skills for today's adults, you might want to, knowing your learners, point them to a specific level and say, hey, here's a link to stories that I want you to you know, spend time reading. And so there's about 15 to 20 stories at every single level. Um, and this would just more directly point them to stories that they can um, you know, work on at any time. Now you're gonna see these titles, this is for adults. So the topics and the context are, are things that are, are adult uh, sort of oriented. So family and safety and parenting, money, health, jobs, um, those are the topics. I'm gonna go to level one here just so you can see the level of the readings at these earlier levels and we'll click into Joe's Workday. So when a learner launches this, they see the story and the reason that this is really well designed for fluency, there's two reasons actually. One, you'll see there's a word count next to each line. That is so students can practice their, um, their rate of reading or their speed of reading uh, in terms of words per minute. You'll see there's a timer here to the left. All they have to do is click on the timer and it is gonna start and then they can start reading the passage. When the timer ends, the word count here tells them what the word, the number of words is at the end of that line. So this will help them give an estimate of um, what their words per minute is. And that's well and good, but speed is not the only um, point uh, or focus that students should be having when we're talking about fluency. They should also be reading, again, with proper intonation, prosody, and enunciation. And so, there's modeling for that on this website. There are three readings of every single story uh, at different speeds. Each one focuses on a different sort of uh, level. So the first reading you can see takes the longest and that's because the reader is reading word, sort of word by word. He leaves for work at 7.30 a.m. I'm not sure if you can hear that too well, but she's just reading word by word. In the second reading, it's with intonation and it's doing more chunking of the, of, the, of the text. So listen here. He leaves for work at 7.30 a.m. So she said he leaves for work at 7.30 a.m. So there's chunking happening to help the students understand how the words should fit together. And then the third reading is with full intonation um, so an inflection. So you can see that that's the most significantly least amount of time to read this passage because she's sort of reading with full fluency. <clears throat> uh, there are questions for the pre and post that students could download and answer on their own. Um, there's also a supplement that is available and you'll see that I've used this supplement in a number of ways um, to provide more options around reading skills for today's adults and some sample activities that I've done. If you download that supplement, and the one that I'm gonna open up is from a different story, but what's really nice about this, and again, in thinking about, hey, when you're back in face-to-face in -face, or even now, um, it is loaded with activities. So it has the vocabulary and terms up front. 
and then it has a vocabulary closed paragraph that has them fill in the blanks with those words. And again, this is related to the passage. Then it has a fill in the blank with sentences using the words from the passage. Then it has a language activity that uh, focuses in this case on uh, simple present uh, simple past verb tenses, <coughs> all in context related to the story. Then it has a speaking activity with sentence starters to help students answer questions related to what happened in the passage. And then it has an assessment at the end for comprehension. So it's loaded full of activities. There are, and then there's a writing activity, sorry, with sentence frames for students at the end. So this covers most of the components of every, every evidence-based reading instruction all in one. Um, and it's pretty um, easy to use for students in terms of the website. Um, and for you, because all of these activities are already created. Now, if your students know how to use a Word document, you could share this and ask them um, to uh, go ahead and fill in these answers. Now, they need to understand that things are going to move around and you might want to model for them how to change that. But this is an openly licensed document uh, that you can use with your students. And so uh, this is a great tool for practicing fluency. <coughs> so one thing I want to show you related to uh, how you could take this content and even go further with fluency, um, both now and you know when you're back in the classroom, there are lots of great tools that you could use with students to have them practice their fluency and not just time themselves on their own. So all of your students who have a smartphone, um, they have a recorder on here. So on iOS, it's called voice notes. If they have an Android Droid phone, it's called audio recorder. You could have them read a story or elements of that story out loud and record themselves. And maybe it's just for personal use for them to be able to play it back and hear themselves read. Or maybe you want to have them read it out loud. And then on both of those tools, you can share the audio recording. And one of the ways you can do is share it through text or share it through email. Um, so that would be a way for you to have a digital means of actually having students share their reading out loud. Um, or you could, you know, more low tech is you could share a passage with them that you want them to read and say, hey, we're gonna have a phone call <laughs> um, and I want you to read out loud for me over the phone. So, you know, there are digital tools that you can be using to practice that fluency. Um, there are also tools that students could use to help them practice, then develop their sort of speaking skills and their intonation and their enunciation. So tools like Google Translate or even any voice to text features that most phones have for anything where you type, um, as well as a tool called Otter AI, which is a tool that I use to transcribe audio um, when I'm doing video recordings because it literally just takes everything you're reading and then transcribes the words into text. Um, these are tools that uh, are effective because if students are speaking into them, um, the, the pronunciation and the intonation and the enunciation that they're using is gonna be reflected in how accurate that is. So I'm gonna show you an activity that I created. Uh, it's in the Wakelet uh, called Practice Fluency Using Google Docs. And so this is an activity that would both be practicing uh, fluency and providing practice for them, but also providing uh, digital skills. So you could use this with any story and just switch out the title and then switch out the sentences. But I, now this is a Google Doc that I've saved. So this first example has been done because I did it in the last session. But it walks through the steps of how to uh, use voice typing in Google Docs. So the way I do that, there's an image here, is I go to tools and I go to voice typing. And again, this icon most students are familiar with because it's also on their phone. And a lot of people use talk to text, right? When they're text messaging, a lot of people, you've probably gotten texts from people that said, oh, stupid voice text, um, because they said something, they just click send and they didn't actually read what they sent. <clears throat> if you talk too fast or if you mumble, um, it is not going to write the correct words in here. So this, these are words from uh, the text that I have in here. And you'll see down here, I attributed, remember I said Creative Commons licensing? So Creative Commons licensing asks that you attribute the source of the content. So I did that here. But uh, there's instructions up here to say, once you're ready, click the microphone icon to begin voice typing. And first you have to make sure 
that you have clicked into the square. So I'm ready to do that and you'll see what happens here. Mr. Larson is his boss. He is happy because Joe is on time. So this provides me as a student with the ability to see if that's recognizing what I'm saying, if I'm using sort of proper um, enunciation. Now you'll notice it didn't punctuate. So a second step to the activity could be, okay, now I want you to go ahead and edit to make sure that it has the proper capitalization and the proper punctuation. Um, and then they could submit this. You could, you could share this as a doc within Google Classroom and everyone would get their own copy and then they could submit it back to you as their assignment. So, um, you know, just some, some clever ways to be using technology that your students do have access to um, to be practicing fluency, uh, which is something that we probably don't spend enough time on um, with our learners unless we're working with early learners. So now vocabulary, we're going to look at a um, resource from Appalachian State University uh, that was developed to focus on tier two vocabulary. So tier two is academic vocabulary. Again, these are words that tend to be uh, heavily present in informational texts. And their curriculum has 38 lessons. These are all Word documents that you can download. Every lesson has five words. They're all tier two words. Um, so it's a total of 190 words. And they follow the same sequence. So at the start of the lesson, students uh, see the five words. And then they are asked to say, if I never heard this word before, I know this word, but I don't know what it means. I've heard it. I think it has something to do with this, or I know the meaning of this word. So it's called a knowledge rating scale. And then they do a few activities that look at the words in context and then do fill in the blanks um, to understand. So now again, you can't, this isn't just fill in the blank with the correct word. This is fill in the blank with something that demonstrates that I know what this word means. So I think the most notable musician I know is my brother, unless their brother is Bruno Mars. Um, then they're probably demonstrating that they don't know what the word notable means, right? So it's not just fill in the blank in terms of, oh, wow, well, you know, um, deductive reasoning. I, I know that this must be the word in there. They have to demonstrate sort of comprehension of the word. And then another activity at the end combines the words uh, where they're being used. And again, where they answer yes, no, or why. <clears throat> so again, they'd obviously have to know the meaning of the definitions of these words in order to answer them correctly. One of the things that we at Crowded Learning did was create supplements for these using Quizlet. And I'm not going to dive into the Wakelet for the sake of time, but in your Wakelet, there's a link to all 38 of those lessons. And then there's a link to Crowded Learning's website, uh, Quizlet website, excuse me, where we've created I didn't mean to do that, but it did because I have hyperlinks everywhere, even in this uh, presentation. Sorry, now I gotta hop out for a second and hop back in. Um, I keep forgetting where I have all these hidden links in, in each of these presentations. So for each one of these lessons, we've created um, Quizlet sets, which are uh, interactive flashcards that allow for students, and they're very mobile friendly, to practice the words uh, with just flashcards that they can flip back and forth and see the word and definition. Then there's writing activities, then there's matching activities. It has audio. So there's a bunch of different formats in which students can be working with the vocabulary from each of these texts. So it provides them with low bandwidth, um, easy to access on their phone resources and links. And then you also have um, these vocabulary activities. Another tool that might be of interest to you so that you could use any reading um, and focus on the vocabulary within it is called the Web Vocab Profiler. Now this is what it looks like. It is not very clean and it's not even very obvious what you do, but all you do is paste text that you like in here. So say you ask learners to read an article about COVID-19. You could copy paste that text, paste it in here, and then it is going to give you the list of tier two vocabulary words that are in that article. <coughs> so these might not be words that students are familiar with. Um, and you could provide this as a vocabulary activity for students uh, to say, hey, these are some words that might be challenging. Find the definition of each of these words. 
um, and because they're going to be used in this passage. So it allows you to provide um, some upfront vocabulary sort of uh, awareness even prior to a reading with any reading that you want from anywhere because it knows all of the words that are tier two vocabulary words from the academic word list and then it just scans the article and it pulls them up like this. So kind of a neat tool if you wanna be bringing in even more authentic readings uh, for students from elsewhere and not just sort of these tools that I'm sharing with you today. Finally, we're gonna look at the comprehension resources um, and we did look at some of these last week but these are the three. The two on the left are ones that all of them require a student account. <clears throat> all of them are free. The two on the left require a little bit more teacher involvement because you have to create classes um, and you have to assign readings to students within these. Uh, read theory is more personalized where all you need to do is create the student account. You could create classes if you want, but it's entirely individualized. Once the student has account, an account and they know how to log in and get there, um, they're on their own. And it, uh, it's going to give them a new reading every time, they, whenever they want, that is leveled based on how they did on the previous reading. Um, so one of the things that is in the Wakelet is an information sheet that we asked educators to share what they know about each of these tools as part of a PD thing that we did last fall. And so we asked them to comment on the levels of the text, on the engagement and the relevance of the text. Uh, is it representative of culture and diversity? Um, are there texts that do that? And what kind of feedback and reporting does it have? So all of the input that's on this document that is linked here in the slide presentation, but also on your Wakelet, um, provides information from teachers about each of these resources, not just the content and the teaching aspect of it, but also technical considerations. So is it hard to use? Do you need a lot of digital skills? And if so, what digital skills do you need? Is it navigable? Is it accessible? So all of that information is there. <clears throat> when we're talking about comprehension, this is obviously uh, rooted in the standards and it is the focus of your TABE reading test um, is learners' levels of comprehension. So the, the way that the standards operate, there are three sort of main categories. There's key idea and details, which is understanding sort of the gist of the text or a paragraph, understanding the details that support it. There's three anchor standards that, uh, that go across all levels. Um, that are part of key idea and details. And this is what it looks like. So this anchor standard, which is part of key idea and details, is summarize the supporting, uh, key, supporting key, the, the key supporting details and ideas, determine the central ideas or themes of a text. And you'll see at each of the levels, again, these are the CCRS levels, this would be tape L, E, M, D, and A. Um, the skills or standards get you know, increasing levels of complexity, but these are the same, these anchor standards across all levels. Craft and structure is looking at the structure of text. Is it compare and contrast or cause and effect? Um, what, uh, what point of view is the author uh, in terms of how they've created this? Are they giving you their opinion up front and then the rest of the article is for them to sort of prove to you that opinion? So is it a persuasive text? Um, so those are the standards that are part of craft and structure. And then integration of knowledge and ideas is being able to do more analysis of text. So evaluating a specific claims, pulling evidence that can uh, confirm and affirm or refute those claims. Um, and also looking at multiple readings of the same topic to be able to do that. Um, so reading two or more texts, which is really important, particularly again, when we're talking about information literacy. Um, so these are important because common lit and read theory both provide reporting uh, organized <laughs> based on those anchor standards. And also, again, of importance is when you're assigning texts, you want to make sure they're at the appropriate level because a student is not going to be able to comprehend a text uh, if it's at too high of a level. <coughs> ReadWorks is uh, one of the three sites. There are 4,000 leveled texts. Uh, the number of them are paired texts. So that gets at that very last uh, Anchor 9 standard where it's looking at multiple texts. That allows you to look at multiple texts on the same topic. All of these are downloadable and printable. You can filter these texts. A lot of these tools are the same both in ReadWorks and in Common Lit. 
And a number of the resources can be adjusted in terms of Lexile level. So I do think that's a nice part of ReadWorks. Many of you have probably heard of or even used Newzella. I used to promote Newzella a lot, um, but it's far less free than it used to be for the first few years it was in existence. Um, but it allowed you for to take an article, a news article, and do four different Lexile levels. Um, Newzella, excuse me, ReadWorks allows you to do that. There will be two different levels for a number of the texts, and that is one of the filters they offer. So when you're looking through the library, you can um, narrow down your search of readings to ones that provide uh, leveling options. And this is what you'll see from the teacher side. You'll see that it does have what are called step reads, which means you can adjust the Lexile levels. It has standards alignments, and it has, in this case, related impaired text to this particular article on political parties. <coughs> One note I have about um, ReadWorks is the audio can be really bad on some of these. I know they're in the process of updating that to be uh, real humans reading as opposed to automated text. So if you want to assign readings in Word, Wix, read works, excuse me, do, but you'll want to make sure that you listen to the audio if that's a tool that you're going to ask your students to use because the computer audio for, you know, lack of better words is terrible. Um, they are updating that for all of their passages, uh, but you'll, so you'll just want to make sure uh, it's one and not the other. Common Lit is very similar to ReadWorks. Um, I find Common Lit is more popular of the two amongst adult educators because it has more adult content for one, uh, and it does have sort of more robust tools in terms of reporting and in terms of interaction with the student and the reading. It has guided reading mode, which allows the student to uh, listen along as they read, and it also has, um, even if they don't use the audio, it has formative uh, question sort of icons in the reading that it wants them to answer before they do the end of lesson, uh, end of reading assessment. And so it has these formative reading checks. That model, remember we talk about direct instruction, model sort of the questions that one might ask themselves of a reading as they are reading. So that is a nice uh, feature that's in common lit. Both of these are all down, uh, do downloadable and printable. So if you are in a no tech world and you have students that cannot access anything, <clears throat> I know some centers are providing packets of readings for their students. So maybe you're printing these out and providing packets for students to um, work on. And again, it could be, here's your packet and on Friday, we're gonna do a good old fashioned phone call and talk about what you learned and maybe talk through some of the passages together. So that's, you know, uh, that's as low tech as you can get. Um, these also are available in Spanish, which I think is important uh, for a number of folks. Uh, another thing I like about uh, Common Lit is the uh, filters are extensive, so you can filter by genre, you can filter by literary device, uh, you can see all of the different topics for which they have text sets. So if you want to integrate social studies or science in there, a lot of these do uh, focus on content areas. And then finally, the themes um, is a filter. And again, you read these like power and greed and morality and love. Um, these are you know, not just kiddish themes. They're ones that are appropriate. Common Lit, read works, they are used heavily in K-12. Um, but I, I think Common Lit has uh, a bit more in terms of appropriateness and um, uh, relevance to adult learners. <clears throat> on the Crowded Learning website, we have a link for Common, a website for, a spreadsheet for Common Lit that has preset filters of their entire library. And what that means is if you click on this in the document, it's going to find all the informational texts that are lexiled at this range, which means they're appropriate for TABE level E or CCRS level B and for which the focus is on key ID and details, which means it's one or all of these three standards. And you'll see that there's 38 readings in there um, that fit that filter. So uh, this shows the number of readings basically at each of those levels, depending on if you wanna focus on key ID and details, craft and structured, or in, uh, integration of knowledge and ideas. Um, as I said, they have downloadable texts. The guided reading is really great because uh, you as a teacher can see the guided reading questions that students will answer. Uh, this is the end of uh, lesson assessment questions that students will answer along with the CCRS 
uh, anchor standard that it aligns to, and then it provides the teacher with discussion questions as well that they can ask. So again, thinking low tech. <coughs> Maybe you don't want to use a web-based video conferencing thing because your students uh, can't do that, but you want to use Zoom because you want to do a group phone call. So you could assign a text through Remind uh, that you want students to, or Google Classroom that you want students to read, and then say on Wednesday, uh, we're going to do, call it book club. I, you know, make it interesting. Uh, we're going to do book club on the readings that I asked you to read. And then everyone can call into that and then talk about the uh, reading. And you as the teacher could use these discussion questions to ask questions out to everybody um, that are intended to sort of have students really analyze the text as it aligns to the standards. So it provides you with all of that here. Um, and again, you can do that for in-person uh, and in virtual environments. <coughs> As I said, just like ReadWorks, it has paired texts, um, which is very nice because you can sort of do various readings around the same topic and look at the different points of view within each of those readings. And so that might be your goal for the week, is I want you to read these three articles on should our cell phones addictive? And then we're gonna have a conversation about that around the readings. I want you to come prepared with evidence that you're gonna talk about from the specific articles that you found was interesting, right? Um, that's a real-time conversation you could have online. Maybe you, you run the Zoom meeting so that you can show the passages for those who can be there, um, but the conversation is relevant to everybody. The other nice thing about Zoom is it will allow you to have a log of the students that joined, so you could use that for you know, tracking time that students are present. In terms of the reporting that Common Lit offers, you can see how they did on each of the guided questions that students do as they're reading, as well as in the summative or end of passage assessment um, <clears throat> with specific details about which uh, standards uh, we're focused on. So the focus specifically of this reading, I don't know what it was, but you'll see uh, reading for information two, reading for information one, reading for information one, reading for information three. So the main focus of these questions was key idea and details, right, um, in that passage. So read theory is the last resource I'm gonna point through. <clears throat> this is the one that is personalized. Um, and so again, just create a student account and then they can work as, as frequently or as infrequently as they want because they're always going to be given um, a new reading whenever they want it. Uh, one of the things that I stress with any of these things is that you teach students, if you can, if it's a mobile-friendly resource, to download a link to their home screen that allows them to just go to it anytime. So Read Theory is a website. There is no app for Read Theory. But if you teach students to, um, and they may already know how to do this, add this page to their home screen, what it will do is you have this button here on iOS that has the share. So sometimes you might wanna share the URL and it's gonna ask you, do you wanna send it as a message? Do you wanna send it in an email? So you can do all of those things that will copy that URL and paste it into these things. But I could also click on this, which is gonna add it to my home screen. And then it's gonna show up as an icon as though it were an app on my home screen, but it's not. When I click on that, it's gonna bring me to the Read Theory website. Um, and in this case, the web browser on the iPhone is Safari. So it is not an app at all, but it's kind of a bookmark that you can put on your home screen on your phone. So I think that's uh, helpful. In terms of the process students go through in Read Theory, <coughs> they will get, once they have an account, a pretest, and it walks through different passages at different lexiles. Uh, the very first one is gonna be at a grade three level lexile, and they answer questions. Based on how they do, they are going to get, uh, say I got that right, then my next question might be slightly higher. And if I get that one right, then my next one might be slightly higher. And then the next one, if I get that right, so it's going to branch up or down to get me to the appropriate Lexile level. Um, and that's where I will be set. And then once I'm in it, I will be able to just read through as many passages as I want. Um, all six of these questions are related to this one passage once I'm actually starting. Um, and I'm not in the pretest. And how I go up and down within the system is going to be based on my performance. Now, in this article, I chose to, and I was at uh, 850 Lexile or grade six equivalency. 
I chose to get the first two questions correct, incorrect because I wanted to see what my feedback would be like. Now, point of use, if I, after every question, I'm gonna get feedback. And you can see it's very detailed in terms of telling me why it was right or why it was wrong. Um, another thing that I like about read theory and actually all of these websites that we've walked through in terms of the reading ones, comprehension ones, is it with the question asks specifically about something within the text, like, hey, the third sentence in paragraph four refers to what? Well, that creates a big obstacle um, for students that might actually be mischaracterizing whether or not they don't know the know or know the answer um, because they not be, may be able to find it based on how it was described. So they have this highlight button that's gonna just highlight the thing that the question is re referring to. So it saves time in terms of having to hunt and peck for things that really isn't a part of student understanding. <coughs> um, once the student has completed the quiz, they'll see how they did and they get knowledge points for each thing. So it's kind of got gaming in it and you can see how many knowledge points you've accumulated. But you'll see I got those first two questions wrong. So I got a 66%. Um, what will happen now is I can go and the teacher can see if the teacher has put this student in a class, my progress. And as I showed you earlier, um, when I started, I was at this level. That passage where I got two wrong was here. And then it brought me sort of back down because it wants to make sure that I uh, sort of, you know, I'm at the level that's appropriate. So in terms of Lexile level, it's going to show me that same thing. So the third quiz that I took uh, was at Lexile level uh, 790. Um, whereas that one that we were looking at earlier, I got the two questions wrong, it was slightly higher. So it's constantly going to sort of move you based on performance. And the nice thing about the reporting and read theory, common lit, remember item by item, it was showing which anchor standard. Read theory, it's showing for me personally how I'm doing in each of those areas amongst which the tape is aligned. So key idea and details, craft and structure and knowledge, uh, integration of knowledge and ideas. So those two questions that I got wrong, both had to deal with key idea and details. So it's really helpful data for you to understand um, what areas students need to be working on in terms of their um, <coughs> reading skills. Now, on a site like Read Theory, or even some of these other sites that have leveled reading, if you don't wanna be, here's the assignment, turn in the assignment, or, or these are the specific readings, but you wanna offer more free reading opportunities, you can always use graphic uh, organizers to focus on a particular skill, to have students fill it out based on whatever reading they want, and even to integrate digital literacy skills. So one of the things that I shared on the Wakelet as an activity that you could do for comprehension, I share two things on here actually. Um, one is a, a Google Doc that I've used, uh, excuse me, it's a Google Slide actually, where it's a template that if you use this, and I'm going to send out an assignment using this in the Google Classroom, um, where you ask students to fill out this graphic organizer in Google Slides based on an article they've read. So this is something that anyone can use. Um, when you use Google uh, Classroom, everyone will get their own copy of this, so they're not gonna be typing over everybody. And you're developing digital literacy skills. You could use this in slides, or you could create, have them create a bulleted list, right, in docs and say, I want you to type the main idea, and then under the main idea, I want you to create a bulleted list of, the, of three to four details that support the main idea. So you're teaching them main idea and details and practicing reading, and you're teaching them text formatting in Google Docs. Um, which is a digital literacy skill. So there's sort of different ways that you can be going about tackling uh, different skills. And more importantly, is providing them with free reading options because that might be the easiest thing for you to do right now. <coughs> so finally, we're gonna get to sharing tools and it does look like we will go over, but less over than the morning one. So this is called improvement. Um, and I will stop for questions and we will play a game at the end. So that was the fun part, I think, that everyone was remembering from the morning. But I wanna look at tools that you could be using to share things out. And this is heavily related to how do you wanna communicate and how sort of synchronous or not synchronous do you wanna be. So you might wanna to use tools like we're looking at today, Padlet and Wakelet. Maybe the Padlet you create is uh, posting a link to a story and sharing the Padlet link with students 
in Remind. If you do that, so now we're using two tools here, but if you do that, here's what could happen. Uh, everyone knows to go to that story, and then everyone has to leave a comment in the Padlet and say, uh, what was their favorite part of the story? Uh, or what was one thing that they learned? Or what was one thing that they thought and now they think differently now that they've read this news article? Um, and they could all be doing that based on this home base of that Padlet. So maybe every assignment you share is in Padlet, and then you can have students co <coughs> collaborate and comment within that Padlet. You could, that Padlet that I showed you, I could have as many things in there that I want. Uh, Wakelet, obviously you're seeing some of the benefits in terms of you could use it as a storage place for all the resources that you want students to use, um, or you could create lessons, which I'll show you a couple uh, right in a second. How you communicate those out uh, is up to you. Maybe it's going to be sort of immediate through these communication tools, or maybe you want us to have more management of those and use something like a Google Classroom um, where you are creating assignments, maybe you are even creating due dates but it's all sort of managed in one place. <coughs> uh, in terms of using Wakelet for something like creating a lesson, um, I did a professional development activity here in Chicago where I was teaching uh, instructors on how to use Quizlet, which is that vocab, those de vocab decks that I was showing you earlier, and Google Forms as an assessment. And we used reading skills for today's adults as the basis of creating these Wakelets. Mm -hmm. Um, so in your Wakelet, you're going to see uh, at the bottom, there are a set of different, um, here under uh, tech-based reading lessons, that here are the lessons that we created in this two-hour session um, where they were using Quizlet and Forms and Wakelet. So I am going to, what was the one that I downloaded here? Uh, 911 Saves Lives. <clears throat> so here is the Wakelet I created, and if you remember this supplement that I shared from Reading Skills for Today's Adults, and I'm able to do this because it's openly licensed. So this has the vocabulary, and this also has the comprehension questions at the end. So we all had access to these, and then different people created Quizlet decks using the vocabulary terms, and then created a, a, a comprehension check using Google Forms. So within this one wakelet now, um, I have 911 saves lives as the story. They can practice vocabulary using Quizlet. They can do the reading and practice their fluency by clicking on this, it will launch that story. And then they can check their comprehension by completing this Google form that has the comprehension questions that were all provided here in this activity. So I'm, I'm bringing in all of the elements of evidence-based reading instruction I'm using this, these various tools that are easy to use, but I'm focusing my students in one area, one sort of launch pad for the various things that I'm going to want them to use. So that's one of the reasons why I think Wakelet's a pretty effective tool um, and why it is kind of uh, taking off with educators because it allows people to, to do that. The other thing that you're gonna to wanna to think about is do you wanna have any sort of assessments that you use with students. And these are popular assessment tools or quiz-based tools. At the end, if you choose to stick around, we are going to play a game together on quizzes so that you can see how that works in a real-time environment um, where everyone is joining a quiz game. And it's much more interesting to learners if it's a game than it's a quiz. Uh, but these are all tools that you could use to provide learners with different options for um, you know, validating their learning and providing uh, assessments of their learnings. <coughs> and so which, you know, these are tools that are important to think about because how do you want to track learner progress? Um, do you want to have it be more conversation based? Do you want students to literally just creep a journal and have them create a, a weekly journal of the tools that they use this week or the lessons that they worked on and summarize what they learned? How simple or complex you make it is up to you. Um, but there's so many tools out there that make it uh, available for you to do. Um, if you use tools like forms, that's going to provide you with reporting or tools like quizzes. I'll show you how the reporting works in quizzes, which I learned this morning. It was the first time this morning I ever did a live quiz um, and it was fun and it's easy to use. Um, or do you want to offer student self-reporting, which is something that I've talked about and I'm going to continue sort of sharing what this looks like in the Google Classroom, but where maybe you create a generic form for students to just 
say their name, say the activity that they completed and say what they learned and how they liked it and then submit that. Then you get all that data. Um, they're just completing the same form every single time they do anything. And that allows for more asynchronous learning um, where students can be using a variety of resources that, that work for them. So maybe they're just doing learning chocolate um, and they're finding sets of words that they wanna learn and master in learning chocolate and then they can report back to you through this form that, hey, I learned these words, here's the link, um, so that you can see what that is. Uh, one thing that I do wanna encourage you to do as a follow-up to this is the EdTech Center at World Education has created a series of uh, distance learning strategy session, uh, sessions every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, they bring in experts to talk about various things for about 20, uh, 10 minutes each, and then we break out, you, whichever one is the most of interest to you, we go into breakout rooms, and you can have more in-depth discussions on those topics. So last week we talked about teacher verification model, which gets into sort of the student self-reporting, and some interesting thing that educators are doing in New Hampshire and Arizona around that. Uh, earlier, the first Friday we did one was on uh, tech tools and, and open and free tech tools, and in particular, how are you communicating with learners? And then this coming weeks is going to be, and it might be, is definitely of interest to me and probably of most educators, is half of it will be Octay, so there'll be a 10 minute talk, talk on what policy go, is going on right now, and then uh, the other one will be on something called HyperDocs, which similar to a Wakelet allows you to pull different things together into one document, and then that document is the lesson um, that students are walked through uh, everything in one place in a digital environment. So uh, I encourage you to go to that. <coughs> I am gonna first, uh, because people I know it's three o'clock where you are, might have to hop off. So I want to address any questions that folks have that are we should do so right now and in person. So I'm going to ask Kevin uh, to, and I, I might look in the chat to see if he's posted things to me. It doesn't look like. Um, and then we're going to play a game uh, using quizzes to see what you've learned, but also for you to see quizzes in action. So Kevin, are there any questions that uh, have come about that you feel I should answer right now? No, Jeff, right now we are good to go. You can go ahead and um, proceed forward with the um, quiz. Awesome. So. Uh, Again, if you have them and you think of some uh, as we play this quiz, please put them in there and we will, um, we will have all of them. Uh, finally, in the Google Classroom and in the follow-ups, I'm gonna be sending out both, after Thursday, once we do the math, uh, I will send out a follow-up survey. But even right now, um, after this, I'm gonna be sending an assignment in Google Classroom. You don't have to do it, but it will be a helpful tool for you to structure your thinking around implementation. So, um, so uh, we're gonna specifically on the implementation plan, ask you to think about how are you gonna communicate with your students? What tools will you use? With what regularity? What content tools are you interested in using? Um, and think about how you're going to use those. So some guiding questions to help you strategize. And then the last thing will be looking at how do you wanna sort of keep regularity in terms of managing those things for your students do you want them to be assignment-based or open-based for you to post on a Padlet or a Wakelet or things like that? So be on the lookout for that. Um, all right, so we're gonna hop into now this quizzes, um, which I am gonna need to launch. I had it open last time. So quizzes is a online um, resource that has, as the name suggests, quizzes uh, from teachers everywhere. <clears throat> so in your Wakelet, you're actually going to see there's a quizzes that I put in the comprehension section that I did not create, um, but I copied it over into my account. Uh, I think it's 10 or maybe 15 questions, but each question has a short little passage, and then it has a question about um, you know comprehension on that passage. Someone else created that, but I was able to bring it in. Um, you can also create quizzes and then search for things, uh, search for a certain topic, and then you can pick the questions that you want to pull into your own quiz. So you don't have to start from scratch uh, when you're using quizzes. So I think it's kind of a really cool tool. But I created a quizzes that is focused on today's reading training. So these are the ones that I have created. I've just started using, as you can see, quizzes. And you can assign these as homework, so you could share it and assign it as homework. 
uh, to students so that they're doing it on their own. Um, you can practice a quiz. So maybe if you're grabbing another teacher's quiz, you want to practice it before you say, yeah, I'm going to use this with my students. Or you can play and host a game live. So maybe you want to assign a reading for students on one day and then say, hey, on Wednesday, we're going to have a call about it and we're going to do a live quiz game using quizzes on that reading passage or on any topic you want, right? It doesn't have to just be reading. Um, and again, that could be something that they don't need to be on something heavy duty. It could just be a smartphone. It's actually very smartphone uh, friendly or mobile friendly. And um, everyone plays live. So we're going to play this live game. It's going to take like three minutes. We have five questions and it's going to be about what you learn. So the first thing that I'm going to do is launch the play live screen. And again, when I did this this morning, it was the first time I'd ever done it. So I had no idea what was going to happen, but I click on play live and uh, I have different options. I could actually create teams so that teams are answering questions and maybe that's something you do in a live class uh, or in, in for a face to face class. Um, but I'm just going to host game that's classic that students answer at their own pace. They complete individually and have a blast along the way. So what happens when I do that <coughs> is you're going to see on my screen that there's this link joinmyquiz.com. Um, I'm going to paste that right here into the chat. And then you can join based on this code. Now, when I highlight it, it actually automatically copies it, which is really cool. So here's the code that you will enter in. And now you're going to start hearing this popping sound. So uh, once you've done that, so joinmyquiz.com. The link is in the chat. And then you enter this code. So we have two people that have joined so far. So again, I know this is a new tool for many of you. So we're going to take our time here. Uh, but I think it's a really very uh, cool tool for folks to use. And so I'm going to see that um, different people have signed up. So again, you go to joinmyquiz.com. And then you're going to enter in this game code. So we have four people in so far, five. And you could do this on your phone. It's actually um, what I've seen this used uh, in trainings, everyone's on their phone and it's, it's very easy uh, to do on, on that. So all you have to do is type joinmyquiz.com um, in, your, in your web browser, on your phone or on your computer, it doesn't matter, and then enter in this code. So I'm gonna wait about 45 more seconds here. Now people are getting, the code is 609-607. And I asked, uh, I said that that way because someone said they're actually using their phone for the Zoom, so they didn't, um, they couldn't actually do both. So it's 609-607 if you're, if you're, joining by phone and you're actually on the phone, I get it, you can't actually see both of those things. So thanks for asking that. So joinmyquiz.com, the code is 609-607. And we'll wait one, a couple more seconds here. Let's get to at least like 25. So we have 20, 20 people in right now, 21. And I think this is just a great point uh, as, we're, as we're watching this, um, you know, making sure that you empathize with students, uh, making sure that students are asking questions uh, if they're not sure how to do something is really important, especially if you're introducing a new tool. Um, a lot of the comments that I hear, and it are 
perfectly valid is it's going to be really challenging for me to try to teach this tool because you can't do it with them in person. And I completely understand that. If you've ever tried to troubleshoot with a parent on technology, um, you know how frustrating it can get because it's just so much easier if you are together and you can show them how to use it in person up front. Um, so recognize that that's a challenge. Um, and again, think about that as you're considering what tools that you want to use. So uh, for the sake of time, because we are about 15 minutes past what we had said, um, I am going to start the game now. We've got about half of you in here, so that's awesome. So what you see is now I see all of the students that have joined. And all I do is click start and we are going to start the game. On your screen, you're seeing you're waiting for the game to start. So now I'm gonna click start. Turn down the volume, and as you are answering, you're going to see there's a leaderboard. Now, in the first one, I wanted to see how this works, so I participated as a student, which wasn't fair because I created the quiz. Um, so I'm not going to do that now. And so now you have this real time sort of, you can see where people are. It's also providing a percentage of overall accuracy of all of my students across all questions, which I think is really fascinating. So you can basically see the aggregate average of all students for the questions that are being asked in this session. We're inching up. And what you also see on the right hand side here is how many students have completed, I think, the assessment, or how many are left, excuse me. I think that's what that number is. So nice job, everybody. Actually, it's over here. I, I misspoke. Over here is where I see that 24 of my 36 students are done. 25 are done. I'm going to wait one more minute. So if the Kevin is Kevin Sharpton, well, that's great because you already saw this quiz this morning. So congratulations, it's the same quiz. Um, all right, we have 37 players and 29 are done. Let's get to 30, awesome. Two. Let me just see, it looks like there's a couple that just haven't uh, attempted, so we will um, we'll wait for maybe one or two more and then go ahead. So just so you can see basically the view as people finish up, I have the ability to look at all of these questions and to see the number of people that got it correct. So I could use this as a tool and then walk through the questions with students, right? So, um, you know, which of these resources focuses on developing fluency? And I can sort by accuracy, which is cool. So what that means is I'm gonna see, this is the one that most people answered correctly. So I think almost all, um, which, well, there was no correct answer. I actually use this as a, as a means of seeing if I could create a poll 
which I cannot, but I can, still can see your individual answers. I'll show you that in a second. Um, what does the E in evidence-based reading instruction stand for? It's evidence, so almost all of you got that right. Today is Tuesday. Uh, I've, I could have made, I have no idea, a correct response if I wanted to, which I probably should have. Um, which is designed to be a learning management system? That's Google Classroom. And then which of these resources focuses on developing fluency? Uh, a lot of them, you can provide fluency with any of them, but reading skills for today's adults is the one that's particularly focused on that. So overall, my class had a 91% accuracy. So that's really nice to see. Um, but now I can end the game. And when I do that, and this, I did not know the answer to this question. I said, I don't know if there is reporting. I think I clicked end game. Um, Uh-oh, I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't, uh, I hope that I did not erase what I was going to show, which I may or may not have done. Um, unfortunately, I may have. At the end of a game, let's see if this gets me there. I'm learning with you, everybody. Um, oh, darn. I guess not. Uh, there's a report and I will have to find, oh, I have reports right here. Look at that. So here is the report from the session that we just did. And if I click on it, I can see how everyone did their level of accuracy. Now I can email their parent. Now I don't have, I would ask, I would get your email, obviously not your parents. This is again, this was designed for K-12, but it's certainly appropriate for everybody. I can see the breakdown of questions. Oh, so I can see this. So, oh, here, I didn't actually look at this view. So now I can see as a professional developer, this is interesting to me, that the one that the most of you are interested in is reading skills for today's adults. Um, so, you know, this, that, so I did, I did create this where every answer was correct. Um, so there was no correct answer. And this allows me to actually sort of poll you to see uh, how you're feeling. So that could be a question at the end of any quiz. Did, like, did you find this helpful? Um, and then you'll have that data. But then I can see the breakdown across all of these uh, things. And then there's a, a, a nice view that allows me to, um, yeah, see, see how students answered on every single uh, question. Um, so really robust reporting. Now I did not tag standards in here. But you will find actually quizzes that teachers have developed where they did tag the standards. So this is just a, a really nice interactive tool. Again, it's easy to, um, to use. You just saw me use it. It's very easy to create a quiz. Um, and what's nice about this and all of those assessment tools is other educators have created quizzes on there. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can find one you like, and then you can add it to my quizzes and then share that with students. So, uh, we will stop there. Um, thank you for staying a little extra to play this game. I hope you found that as a helpful and enjoyable uh, end of session activity and something that you can use with your students. Um, we will continue to sort of uh, look to see where there are needs and make sure that there are trainings available to you on these tools. As I said, I will provide you with an implementation plan template that will be a sort of a guide for you to think about how you want to move forward. Um, I will also continue to be just actively doing things in the Google Classroom, um, just as a exercise one for me to get more familiar with Google Classroom, but also um, to provide you with information, resources, and answers to questions uh, as they come up, as well as to uh, give you some experiences as a student so you can see if this is a tool either now or in the future you wanna use with your students. Um, so with that, I will say thank you. I hope you found this helpful and uh, look for follow-ups with this recording, with all the links that we uh, shared out and additional information in the very near future. Thank you very much.